I'm going to give you an update in TNF inhibitors for psoriasis. The objectives for this presentation are first to review the TNF alpha inhibitors that are approved for treating plaque psoriasis, to discuss the association between TNF alpha inhibitors and cardiovascular disease in plaque psoriasis patients, and finally, I'll describe a few recent updates in TNF alpha inhibitor use for plaque psoriasis. The discovery that TNF-alpha may play a role in psoriasis inflammation dates back at least to the late 1980s when researchers determined that serum TNF-alpha levels were elevated in psoriasis patients, and this led them to hypothesize that perhaps TNF-alpha may play a role in psoriasis inflammation. And of course, now we know well that that is true as the TNF-alpha inhibitors were really the first class of biologics that revolutionized our ability to take care of adult patients with moderate to severe plaque psoriasis. Currently, there are three TNF-alpha inhibitors that are approved, etanercept, infliximab, and adalimumab. And as you can see here, they were all first approved for psoriatic arthritis, but shortly thereafter were approved for moderate to severe plaque psoriasis. And if you look at those dates, you can see that now we have at least 10 years of real world experience with all of these medications. And in fact, for etanercept, almost 15 years. It's hard to believe that that much time has already gone by. But because of that time, these medicines are in a sense tried and true. We know them and we trust them. And although we are absolutely spoiled with the options we have available to us to treat moderate to severe psoriasis, the fact that we have this longer term efficacy and safety data for the TNF-alpha inhibitors compared to all those other classes makes us and patients comfortable. And importantly, a lot of that data is actually real world data. So let's talk a little bit about the long term efficacy data. There's long-term efficacy data for all three of these. For infliximab, it has been shown that the majority of patients who reach a certain POSI score seem to maintain that score for relatively long periods. For etanercept, the Observe 5 post-marketing safety surveillance registry looked at, this was a five-year prospective study with over 2,500 patients. And again, the majority of patients maintain efficacy through 60 months of treatment. For etanercept, there was a three-year open-label extension study of their phase three reveal trial, again showing that patients who had a maintained POSI score for 33 weeks were likely to maintain that POSI score through years two and three. And Etanercept also has the ESPRI 10-year post-marketing surveillance registry and eight-year interim results where 6,000 patients were initially enrolled were recently published in a poster at our annual AAD meeting in 2018, again showing that as observed effectiveness of adalimumab remains stable through eight years. What about long-term safety data? Those same studies seem to show that these medications are really quite safe. For infliximab and their two-year long-term study showed that only about 14% of these patients discontinued medication during the treatment phase, the most common reason being infusion reactions, which is, of course, unique to infliximab in the TNF-alpha inhibitors. And for the Observe 5, greater etanercept exposure over time was not associated with any increased rates of serious adverse events or serious infectious events. And in the eight-year results of the Esprit 10-year post-marketing data, there have been no new safety signals with adalimumab treatment. And in fact, the number of treatment emergent deaths in the registry is below expected for what is comparable in the general population. Now, in addition to these long-term individual medication studies, we also have large registries that collect data from patients on a variety of systemic medications. So not just TNF-alpha inhibitors, but traditional medicines like methotrexate and other classes of biologics. And one of the most common that you'll see with publications is the SOLAR database. 
they published this paper in JAMA Dermatology in 2015, looking at the risk of serious infection with biologics and systemic treatments. Over 11,000 patients were enrolled at that time. And what they showed is that with the TNF-alpha inhibitors, the rates of serious infection were quite low, between about 1.5 and 2.5 per 100 patient years, with adalimumab and infliximab having a slightly higher risk compared to non-methotrexate and non-biologic therapies. What about malignancy? So this is data that has recently been published from the SOLAR database in, in, in the JAD. At this time, they had over 12,000 patients enrolled. 250 malignancies were identified. So if you read this paper, what you'll read is that when the TNF-alpha inhibitors are all lumped together, then exposure for at least 12 months was associated with increased malignancy risk versus no exposure to a TNF inhibitor. However, when these analyses were adjusted and the TNF-alpha inhibitors were separated into individual medicines, then exposure for at least 12 months was no longer statistically significant for any risk. And additional analyses that attributed the malignancies to either the most recent systemic psoriasis treatment, so a lot of these patients are on multiple treatments, or when cases were excluded, if they were, patients were exposed to multiple study therapies, also did not show any increased risk of malignancy when people were exposed to TNF inhibitors. And in fact, the bulk of the data, including the long-term extension of pivotal trials for the three medicines FDA approved for psoriasis, have really shown that there's no increased risk of malignancies. And in some of these cases, the rates are par comparable to what we see in just the general population databases. Now, what about cardiovascular event risk and improvement? In some ways, I think this is sort of the holy grail question that we want to know about biologics in general and perhaps the TNF alpha inhibitors specifically. And there's a lot of data. So this was a poster at the AED in 2016 from the Solar Registry looking at cumulative rates of major adverse cardiovascular events per 100 patient years. And you can see the TNF alpha inhibitors were associated with very low risk of MACE events, similar to when all the biologics were combined, all the medicines were combined, lower than what we see with topical or phototherapy. And there's an absolute wealth of research published in the peer-reviewed literature that shows TNF-alpha inhibitor use is associated with decreases in risk factors for cardiovascular disease, improvements in insulin resistance, decreases in pro-inflammatory cytokines, and even improvement in things like carotid intima media thickness or aortic stiffness. So in terms of those risk factors, there uh, is a lot of improvement. Now, Dr. Cooper touched on this study. This was just published in the JAD 2018 by Josh and Wu. And what they did here was compare cardiovascular events in patients treated with either TNF inhibitors or phototherapy. And they used this large claims database. They had over 11,000 patients on TNF inhibitors, over 12,000 patients on phototherapy. And their definition of a major cardiovascular event was hospitalization for either an MI stroke, a TIA, or unstable angina. And they showed that the TNF-alpha cohort had a significantly lower risk of cardiovascular events that started about four months from the index date. And also that longer cumulative exposure with the TNF inhibitors were associated with further risk reduction in major cardiovascular events. Dr. Wu did a similar study published a year earlier where they compared patients on TNF inhibitors to patients on methotrexate. The same database, the same definition for major cardiovascular events. And again, the TNF inhibitor cohort had fewer major cardiovascular events than the methotrexate cohort. And over a median follow-up of 24 months, every additional six months of TNF inhibitor exposure was associated with an additional 11% risk reduction in major cardiovascular events. Now, these studies are far from perfect. There are limitations. Number one, it still is a relatively short follow-up from their index date. And number two, we really didn't know what the severity 
uh, of the psoriasis was in these pati individual patients in each group, among other limitations. So it would be great to do placebo-controlled studies. And Dr. Cooper touched on uh, this study as well. So this was published last year in the Journal of Investigative Dermatology. It's a randomized placebo-controlled study where 107 patients were randomized one-to-one -to, -one to receive either adalimumab or placebo for 17 weeks, and then there was crossover to adalimumab. And these patients had PET-CT scans at baseline and other time points to assess ascending aorta as well as carotid target to background ratio, which used as kind of a surrogate for vascular inflammation. And in this study, they showed absolutely no change from baseline in the ascending aorta wall uh, target to background ratio or in the carotid wall target to background ratio at week 16 between the patients who were given either adalimumab or placebo and in fact no change even over 52 weeks in patients with adalimumab for the ascending aortic wall uh, uh, target to background ratio and in, there was an increase in the carotids. So there was no difference in this study in terms of vascular infl inflammation in those major uh, vessels. However, there was a decrease in high-resolution CRP levels that was significant after 16 weeks. So this provides some experimental evidence of potential benefit in using the TNF inhibitors. There is another study that is in press that I think you will hear about in your emails, in print journals, in editorials. This is a study by Joel Gelfand and his colleagues called the VIP trial. It's similar, placebo-controlled, well-powered, and again, it demonstrated no benefit of a TNF inhibitor on aortic vascular inflammation. And on the other hand, ca cardiovascular risk biomarkers were significantly decreased in these patients. So I think it's important to understand that vascular inflammation and a change in vascular inflammation does not equal a change in cardiovascular events. So these medicines still may decrease cardiovascular events, but I think the take-home message from all the work, as Dr. Gelfand uh, states in this upcoming editorial that Dr. Cooper also mentioned, is that despite all the research we've done looking at this question, we're still very early in getting the answer, and we need more studies to really determine w how do these medicines impact cardiovascular risk in the future. So what's new with the TNF inhibitors? I think the combination of using TNF inhibitors, in particular with methotrexate, is a very interesting story. Where does this come from? The combination of TNF inhibitors and methotrexate really comes from the rheumatoid arthritis literature, where it, it seems very clear that the combination of a TNF inhibitor and methotrexate is, has more efficacy than the TNF inhibitor alone. And rheumatologists naturally extrapolated this to patients with psoriatic arthritis. And we, who treat psoriasis, learn this combination from them. So in this paper in JAMA Dermatology in 2015, really looked at what is the evidence out there for combining these biologic therapies with systemic medicines like methotrexate. We do know that the combination of TNF inhibitors and methotrexate seems to reduce formation of anti-drug antibodies compared to when using a biologic alone. And the adverse effects are pretty similar when you're using a TNF inhibitor alone or you're combining it with methotrexate. In this paper by April Armstrong and her colleagues, when they review the evidence, there's actually very strong evidence that the combination of etanercept and methotrexate is more effective at treating psoriasis than either etanercept or methotrexate alone. And there's okay evidence suggesting that the combination of infliximab or adalimumab with methotrexate may be more efficacious at treating psoriasis than the biologic alone. Now, we also don't know what, what is the correct dose of methotrexate to use to gain that efficacy uh, without increasing the adverse effects and it may vary depending on the patient or even the TNF-alpha inhibitor utilized. What's interesting is that if we look at the studies that have been done in the psoriatic arthritis world, this combination, even though we learned it from rheumatology colleagues, does not really seem to be panning out in psoriatic arthritis. In a number of registries and other studies, that combination either had no benefit or a very small benefit 
in terms of being more efficacious than the TNF inhibitor alone. It does appear that adding methotrexate may improve drug survival, where there was a trend in some of these studies, or there was significantly longer drug survival in another study. And two studies published in the Journal of Rheumatology in 2016 also addressed this question. One were the results of two clinical trials looking at etanercept monotherapy or combination therapy with methotrexate, and the other looked at adalimumab monotherapy versus concomitant methotrexate. Both of these papers show that there seemed to be no improvement in adding methotrexate to the TNF inhibitor in terms of better control or better uh, results in controlling the psoriatic arthritis. So I think it's interesting that uh, if anything, as of right now, it seems that th this combination may have the most utility in our patients with moderate to severe psoriasis. And I, I really have a strong feeling and have for a while that we probably, as dermatologists, underutilize this combination. Now, certainly, it's not um, uh, best to use this in every patient, but I think there are patients out there where we probably should be using this more often than we do to get optimal effects uh, with these patients. Also, treatment of plaque psoriasis in children with TNF inhibitors. This study with the Tannercept was actually published in the New England Journal of Medicine back in 2008, a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial. Etanercept had good efficacy in terms of achieving POSI 75 or POSI 90 compared to placebo, and it looked pretty safe. Only 10 significant adverse events, all resolved without sequelae. But the FDA did not want to approve this medicine at that time. They wanted more safety data concerning the use of this medicine in children with plaque psoriasis, although it was approved for juvenile idiopathic arthritis. In 2016, a long-term safety and efficacy study was published, five-year open label extension, and again, what they showed was there were mild adverse events that were common, as we know, with this class of medicines, but only eight significant adverse events, only one considered to be related to etanercept. It was cellulitis, no deaths or malignancies, and overall, the safety data was very similar to what we see in patients with juvenile idiopathic arthritis, and finally, the FDA approved this medicine for treatment of children for, who have moderate to severe plaque psoriasis in November 2016, and that is a huge step forward in our ability to treat these young children who, uh, as you know, when you have moderate to severe plaque psoriasis, their classmates at that age may not always be so understanding uh, and forgiving of seeing that on their skin. And finally, I think one of the most interesting ongoing stories in the TNF inhibitor world is sertolizumab. Sertolizumab is FDA approved to treat psoriatic arthritis and has been since 2013. Soon in the JAD, you will see published the results of two phase three studies, SIMPASI-1 and SIMPASI-2, that included a good number of patients in each uh, of these studies. They were followed for 48 weeks. And what we see if we look at POSI-75 scores is at week 16 at the higher dose, 82% of patients by week 16 reached a POSI 75, and that was maintained out to week 48. And 52% of patients at week 16 reached a POSI 90, and that even increased a little bit by 60 to 61% in patients with moderate to severe plaque psoriasis. The other interesting part of the sertolizumab story has to do with pregnancy. If we really look at the research that has been done using TNF inhibitors as a class in pregnant women, the data looks very promising. These medicines seem to be safe and, and overall support TNF inhibitor use during pregnancy. But one of the biggest concerns is that in late pregnancy, exposure to these medicines results in crossover and uh, um, uh, active placental transfer from mother to infant, and that can increase the risk of infection in newborn infants. So first of all, 
uh, Sarah Delizu Mab published this, the largest cohort of pregnant women exposed to a TNF inhibitor. They had over 1,500 exposures that were followed during pregnancy. Over 1,100 of these were maternally exposed pregnancies that were followed prospectively. Outcomes are known for over 528. There are about 200 that are still ongoing pregnancies. Most of these pregnancies were exposed to sertilizumab at least during the first trimester when organogenesis primarily occurs. And it really shows what we've kind of known about the TNF inhibitors at large, and that is, it's, this seems to be safe. There were no trends linking congenital malformations to this exposure, and uh, frequencies of other comorbidities, such as preeclampsia or gestational diabetes, were pretty um, uh, similar to what we've seen in the past. This is where I think it really gets interesting. This was a study that was actually presented as a poster at the annual AAD meeting in 2016. Sertilizumab lacks the FC moiety, and that prevents it from binding to placental neonatal FC receptor and inhibits its placental transport so that it's not found in a newborn infant's drug, uh, blood. This study is, I, I believe, maybe you can be, find it online. I'm not sure if it's in print yet. But it evaluated the placental transfer of sertilizumab from 16 sertilizumab-treated pregnant women to their infants. And of 14 infants at birth, 13 had no quantifiable sertilizumab levels at birth. One had a minimal level detected, but if you look at the uh, ratio between infant and mother plasma, it's exceedingly low. So really to conclude, there seems to be no or minimal sertilizumab transfer from mother to infants during the third trimester and supports that this can be used safely during pregnancy when considered necessarily. So this is, again, an evolving story. Will sertilizumab eventually get FDA approval for moderate to severe psoriasis? And if it does, will it actually become the anti-TNF agent of choice in women of childbearing potential? So in summary, the TNF inhibitors, despite class after class of new biologics coming out, and you think, what is this going to do to the TNF inhibitors? I think like our traditional systemic medicines, they stick around and I think part of that is because we are familiar with these medicines and our patients like the fact that there is long-term efficacy and safety data. Additionally, I think it's important to recognize that these may have more efficacy when used in combination with methotrexate in the right patient population. And in fact, exploration into expanded use of these medications for different indications within the spectrum of psoriatic disease continue, including new indications in pediatrics and in pregnant patients, and even perhaps in the future we'll have an expanded repertoire if sertilizumab gets approval by the FDA.